Before the curtain comes down on the UN's annual climate change summit, let's give you the short version. The news ain't good. The planet's getting warmer, faster. China's carbon emissions are back on the rise. India's capitals blanketed in what feels like record smog. And the United States is not only pulling out of the Paris Agreement, it's also slashing its funding for the UN research to stop the planet from overheating. On Wednesday, France's president in Bonn, Germany, called on Europe to pick up the tab on climate science. Interestingly, while Emmanuel Macron grabbed headlines at the COP23 summit, his host, Angela Merkel, made sure her speech was as boring as can be. Turns out the German chancellor's currently in coalition talks. So if it's all the same, she'd rather avoid long lectures on how her nation's energy transition relies on that Donald Trump favorite, coal. So if scientists insist we need to act fast to save the planet, what then is the plan? Today in the France 24 debate, how to clear the air over quickly cutting carbon emissions. And with us from Bonn, Lutz Weischer of uh, Environmental and Development Group German Watch, which most notably publishes its annual Climate Change Performance Index. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. From Akershus in Norway, Philip Rippmann, senior analyst at uh, the investment firm uh, Storbrand, Storbrand, which recently divested from coal. Thank you for joining us. Now, uh, this year, the Nobel Economics Prize uh, went to a behavioralist, so uh, we decided to uh, uh, call one up from the uh, uh, Norwegian capital, Per Espen Stocknes, climate psychologist and director of the Center for Green Growth at the Norwegian Business School. Welcome to the show. Hello, great being with you. The France 24 debate on Facebook and on Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. Let's start with the latest from Bonn, Germany. It was the United States' turn this uh, Thursday to address the COP23 summit. Just to give you an idea of how much climate change matters to Donald Trump, the speech delegated to the State Department's acting assistant secretary of state for oceans and international environmental and scientific affairs. France 24, science editor Mary Dundas has more. Already it wasn't the top-ranking person in Washington. It was Thomas Shannon who was delegated to speak here after a family emergency. Judith Garber had to step in, acting secretary, as you mentioned. Uh, she spoke for around five minutes and she opened her speech with a reiteration of Donald Trump's intention to withdraw from this Paris Agreement, but dangled that possibility that they would rejoin if the conditions were more favourable. She did then go on to say, regardless of their opinion of this agreement, which is, of course, negative at the moment. Uh, the US would continue to be a leader in the energy transition, regardless of the source of electricity. She made a reference to carbon capture technology, was often used to go hand in hand with the continued use of coal. Comes after a series of other blows while they've been here. The delegation was half the size. They wouldn't fund a pavilion and they participated in a side event that promoted the use of coal as part of the solution. Many here saying it's like agreeing, the US being here is is like agreeing to a divorce, but living under the same roof. It makes for some uncomfortable bedfellows. Uh, Lutz Weischer, uh, how awkward was it having uh, the U.S. delegation there this Thursday? It was, I guess it was OK because no one really paid much attention to it. These speeches are delivered in front of a half-filled room while the real negotiations are uh, are going on elsewhere. You, you have to imagine that we have two days of speeches by heads of delegation or ministers. I mean, most countries are indeed represented at a much higher level than the US was this time. Um, but there were no surprises in that speech. Um, and in the meantime, real negotiations on the substance of what needs to be agreed in Bonn were going on. So I guess it was okay. You guess it was okay. So what is going on behind the closed doors far from the cameras right now? Uh, what is going on is that delegates are trying to uh, agree to draft text on the rules for implementing the Paris Agreement. You basically have to imagine the agreement as um, 
a, a, a basic law or constitution that sets out some basic obligations and principles, and then you need the implementing guidelines, the technical stuff. That's actually really important to ensure that there's transparency, that countries can trust each other, that they're actually doing what they're promised. So, so that all needs to be defined, and they've set themselves a deadline to do this by the end of next year. And here in Bonn, they needed to make progress on that. At the same time, they also need to talk about how to increase ambition, because no country is doing enough. Uh, our climate uh, change performance index actually showed that we left the first three ranks empty because we came to the conclusion no country is doing enough yet. So they need to talk about this ambition cycle, this idea that every five years we will all come back together and revise our targets upwards. And uh, this first, the first round of that ambition cycle, the first round of increasing targets will start next year. And that was the other big topic here in Bonn. Yeah, and uh, next year sounds like it's going to be crucial. Of course, without the United States, it upsets the balance. And with the U.S. withdrawing funding from the U.N.'s climate research branch, France's president in Bonn on Wednesday calling on Europe to pick up the slack. I hope that as many European states as possible, together, will be able to compensate for the loss of American funding. But I can guarantee you that starting in 2018, the IPCC will not be short a single cent to function to move forward and inform our decisions. Philip Ripman, your reaction? Our reaction, well, we put the Paris Agreement as a basis of how we invest. And I mean, we're a 250-year-old pension company. We want to be here for the long term. So that is exactly what we're doing. We're thinking long term. And for us, climate change is a reality and coal is not the future. We started selling off coal in 2013, along with a lot of oil sands assets. Uh, what we just came with this week is that we have put uh, basically a ban on any investments in companies that are planning to build new coal-fired power plants. And this is also, we feel, part of, of living up to our obligation that is set out in the Paris Agreement and that will hopefully be cemented now in Bonn. Uh, with the uh, United States uh, withdrawing, it's really hitting home with this summit this year. It's an annual summit, but at this one in Bonn, it really does hit home. And you, you heard the French president there saying Europe is going to step in and at least pick up the slack when it comes to uh, research at the United Nations. How much can Europe do if uh, the United States government is no longer a party to all this? Well, without commenting specifically on Europe, I think what's important is that the financial industry actually now starts waking up to this reality. And we see that really across the board. The financial industry is putting climate change as part of the basis for how they're making investments and they're changing their investments accordingly. And I think the financial industry can contribute to actually shifting 40 trillion U.S. dollars, which is currently in the pension market, towards a greener alternative. Uh, moving it already. So uh, in other words, uh, and let me bring in Per Espen Stockness on this, uh, the private sector has already moved on. You're not too concerned about uh, what Donald Trump says? Um, some... Social scientists are speculating whether Donald Trump's uh, kind of very hard, very reluctant, very um, provocative uh, stance is actually um, firing up people to uh, contribute to um, a much kind of counter pushback. Uh, so starting a transformation and maybe actually increasing uh, the speed of this uh, bottom up transition of the um, energy uh, sector and society that we're seeing. Um, my research has been linked to looking into um, what actually engages people in um, solving global warming? So how? Yeah, because because here's the question, Per Espen Stockness. You you yeah. We're talking about uh, something that's taking place in the future. Now, most people, when they think of the future, sure, they might put money aside for their retirement, but are they really thinking decades ahead? It seems so abstract. It is. Uh, and we call this the psychological distancing, that uh, when scientists speak about the year 2100 or 2050, it just pay places the issue 
far out of our uh, attention span, so to speak. And also the imagery that's been used of smelting ice, here, ice glaciers and polar bears, these kind of things says it's not here. And finally, all these cops and the, and the imagery of um, people being suffering from floods like in, in Greece or the extreme hurricanes in the Caribbean also position that this impacts somebody else. So in terms of space, time and social impacts and also responsibility, many people easily put that a climate issue as very far, very distant away from me. Um, so that's one of the basic psychological barriers uh, climate communicators have to overcome. Uh, another barrier has been uh, the doom and the catastrophe barrier. And we also heard this in this program, um, how the trends are very dire and uh, the science is looking worse and worse. And um, we're all heading towards uh, a boiling earth, so to speak. Um, but this psychologically provokes um, responses like habituation and then avoidance because we don't really like to hear about this. It gives us a ceiling of guilt and fear. Um, and to overcome these main barriers, such as the, the doomsday barrier and the distance barrier, we need to speak about climate change in a much more, um, so we say, engaging way. A more engaging way. Let me bring in uh, Lutz Weischer on this because uh, Lutz, uh, here in Paris, we... we we had the front page headline of Le Monde a couple of nights ago, uh, the, the broad sheet of record here, uh, screaming headline, it will soon be too late to stop the planet from overheating. Uh, do you agree with what you just heard there from Per Espen Stuckness? Yes, I mean, I would agree that um, communicating about climate change as though it's it's a problem that's that's distant and in the future, um, increasingly, unfortunately, people are, are experiencing that it's something that's happening and that's impacting them already today. Uh, saying, you know, we, we are doing this for future generations. Of course, we are also doing this for future generations, but we're also doing it for us right now. Uh, German Watch also publishes a climate risk index that looks at the impacts of extreme weather events. And uh, they get worse every year. Uh, this year, we had the U.S. in there prominently amongst the top 10. They all they also impact developed countries. Everyone is, uh, or, or a growing number of people are actually experiencing the, the effects of climate change already. So I think that's, that is important to communicate. And of course, this COP was, was happening in Germany, but it was not hosted by Germany. The presidency of these negotiations was actually with the Pacific Island nation of Fiji. And if you talk to Fijians here, climate change is a really real phenomenon that's that's happening right now. There's people that have to leave their villages. There's uh, uh, um, agriculture that can't happen anymore because uh, soils are, are salinated and so on. So I think that's important. And it's also important to not lose hope. Um, the Paris Agreement has an effect. Um, we were slated for four to six degrees of global warming, at least, um, with the national targets that have been agreed in the Paris Agreement. We're currently looking at around three degrees. That would be a total catastrophe, but you can still see that the, the agreement has already had an impact. And with what the negotiators are now trying to achieve um, with uh, harder climate targets that will need to be agreed in the next years, we will do what we can to reduce that even further and actually meet the goals uh, of the agreement, which is well below two degrees. With renewable energies getting cheaper all the time, um, with more companies uh, shifting their investment, as we just heard, with more cities and states and, 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 and companies doing more, um, I think there's also signs of hope. And Donald Trump, as you said uh, in, in uh, your first question, um, actually helped in an in a ironic way. Um, we have this re counter reaction from uh, from the U.S. in particular, I mean, there's been the biggest U.S. pavilion we've ever had at a COP. It was just not organized by the federal government. But you had U.S. states, businesses, companies, universities, citizens groups. They all came here. They all pledged. We are still in. And they actually made a pledge that they will try to meet America's national target with subnational action. So um, Donald Trump has sort of spurred them into action, the commitment by Macron to say, I will fund the World Climate Science Council, the IPCC, um, myself, uh, or France will, uh, if necessary. I think that that's, that's also one of those reactions. So um, it's a very 
dangerous situation, but there is hope. A very dangerous situation. There's still hope. Uh, there are still many points in which the countries that don't include the United States uh, disagree on, uh, most notably over that issue of coal in a year that's seen spiking air pollution in places like India. We're going to talk about it when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 today. Down to Earth, presented by Merit Dundas. The Arctic is going to be exploited and the scale of this exploitation will only grow. We have a beautiful planet, we need to protect it, and we can use space exploration to better understand it. Now we, we've moved from, is that real, to what do we do about it? Join us on Down to Earth as we explore the incredibly complex relationship between humans and our planet. We're here to ask the difficult questions and find answers that may just surprise you. Down to Earth on France 24 and France24.com. Revisited, presented by Stuart Norval. In 1941, Hitler decides to invade Russia. In Leningrad, the resistance opposes the German army. The siege lasts 900 days. Nearly 80 years later, the city has recovered its historic name of St. Petersburg. And on its outskirts, volunteers still search to find unburied soldiers. Today, this dark page in history has not been forgotten. Survivors tell their stories, and young children still learn about the siege of Leningrad. Revisited on France 24 and France 24.com. Welcome back. Before we resume the France 24 debate, some of the stories we're following for you with Laura Cellier in the newsroom. South Africa's defense and security ministers in Zimbabwe to meet with the military and Robert Mugabe, the country's only ruler since uh, it ended uh, white minority rule back in 1980. He's reportedly refusing to step down despite detention by soldiers. Israel's army chief of staff tells a Saudi news website his country is ready to share information if necessary with Riyadh. Riyadh, which uh, Lebanon's prime minister claims he'll soon be leaving. Saad Hariri, now expected in France. We'll tell you about shuttle diplomacy around the Lebanon crisis. And in France, a di fresh day of strikes and marches against labor reform, but it floundered with, according to police, just half the turnout of the last big Paris demonstration. That and the celebrations in Lima and elsewhere as Peru beat New Zealand to book the 32nd and the final spot for next year's World Cup in Russia in sports. Simon Harding looks ahead to Friday's World Cup draw. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're speaking on the eve of the conclusion of the COP23 annual UN Climate Summit it's taking place this year in Bonn, Germany. Uh, Lutz Weischer is with German Watch, based in the former West German capital, and uh, he's a delegate there with, the, uh, with that international uh, uh, climate policy group. Uh, with us uh, from Akershus in uh, uh, southeastern Norway, Philip Rippmann of uh, the investment firm Storbrand, which recently uh, divested from coal. We'll be talking more about that in a moment. And uh, we're joined as well by Per Espen uh, Stockness, climate psychologist, economist, director of the Center for Green Growth at the Norwegian uh, Business School. Uh, we'd like for part two of our discussion to also welcome the uh, uh, sec uh, secretary uh, ministry at the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change of India taking part at uh, the summit. Uh, Sri Arun Kumar Mehta, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. 
In India's capital, let's begin there, air pollution levels currently 12 times the, the accepted norm. Uh, over the past few days, construction and truck traffic had been stopped. It's now been allowed to resume this Thursday. After a slight dip in the readings, every year at this time, crop burning, industrial smog, vehicle exhaust, and the lower winds uh, speeds combine to envelop New Delhi in smog. Politicians right now bickering over who should pay the estimated $600 million needed to provide farmers with alternatives to crop burning. Meanwhile, citizens say they're gasping for breath. It's become very difficult to breathe. Our eyes are irritated. We're suffocating. It's the worst situation I've ever seen from pollution. It's very, uh, like, dangerous and it's like smoking 50 cigarettes a day. Like smoking f 50 cigarettes a day? Sri Arun Kumar Mehta, would you confirm that for us? We have a system of measuring the air quality index and uh, we publish that air quality index every day. So there is, there is a constant monitoring that, is, that goes on, and uh, there has been problem of air pollution. Particularly, we had one period of a smog last year, and this year again, we had recurrence of that problem. But we have looked at the problem. We have drawn up our plans how to tackle it. This year, we were not very successful in managing the crop burning, but hopefully next year, we have identified various technological alternatives as well as other alternatives. And I'm confident that by next year, we will have a better situation than what we witnessed this year. We've seen in China how well it's uh, the government has, in fact, as the air pollution's gotten worse and worse in Beijing, uh, it's become, well, a question almost of national security improving the air quality. Has it gotten to that point in India? We have uh, looked at this problem of air pollution all across the country, not only Delhi. And we have identified 100 cities which have a problem of what we call non-attainment cities. We, have we are drawing up plans to improve air quality in all those cities, including Delhi. And uh, we have very concrete plans in our mind. We have very, uh, very clearly determined goals that we have for the next three years. All right, so so one of those let's talk about one of those concrete plans, plans. And we are going to be able to manage it, hopefully. Let, let's talk about one of those concrete plans. How do you stop one of crop burning? Uh, how how do you stop the crop burning? Okay. Fundamentally, we must uh, take into account the fact that nobody wants to burn something that is a resource. So that, that resource has a value. Similarly, the crop residue has a value. And we want to use that particular idea to ensure that we are able to incentivize farmers in order to enable them not to opt for crop burning, but offer other alternatives. For example, one is that we use straw briquettes for power generation. In fact, National Thermal Power Corporation, that is NTPC, it already is moving in that direction. That is one option. Then we have other options, for example, bioethanol, we have bio CNG, we have proposal for biodiesel. So there are various alternatives. It, uh, apart from that, there are mechanized solutions which are also being looked at. The, this year we had decided that we'll expect, we will expect all these districts which are affected by uh, this problem of crop, crop burning, uh, they will make up plans. Uh, so how they will ensure that this doesn't happen time and again. And uh, by next year, we think that we will be able to at least make a difference. All right. Worldwide, a recent report by the science magazine Nature uh, showed air pollution has uh, really uh, spiked using uh, uh, World Health Organization statistics. It kills directly four and a half million people a year. There you see a map that shows how much, well, life expectancy is reduced by air pollution. Uh, the parts, of course, in darkest red are the worst uh, affected. Uh, Lutz Weischer, uh, your reaction to what you just heard there from the, the uh, minister? Uh, well, clarify, I think it minister. shows that air pollution is a really serious... Lutz Weischer. Um, yes, um, I think what we heard is uh, air pollution is a really serious problem in many countries. Um, 
and uh, pollution causes health problems and deaths. And that's also the case, for instance, in my country, where the health impacts of coal are not to be underestimated. Um, uh, maybe there's less smog in uh, urban areas, but we still have uh, our own share of, of air pollution, pollution issues that need to be tackled, uh, both from uh, our over-reliance on, on, on cars, particularly cars with, with diesel engines, uh, and our over-reliance on coal. Yeah, that brings us to coal. Uh, worldwide output diminishing and could further, what with uh, 20 nations led by Canada and the UK, announcing they would phase coal out completely by 2030. Coal is literally choking our cities and our people. Around the world, we see close to a million deaths a year from air pollution created by burning coal. Not only is there a human cost, there is also a huge economic cost, totaling billions of dollars a year. Yeah, and uh, the, uh, uh, that announcement, uh, Philip uh, Ripman, uh, it's coming from... Uh, 20 nations, which are not big coal producers, nothing to on par with the likes of China, India, or even Germany, for that matter. Uh, nonetheless, is it important, that announcement? Absolutely, it's important. Um, but I do think the fact that we're still here discussing coal is a little bit worrying because we know the effect that coal-fired power plants has on climate change. We know the effect that coal-fired power plants has on local pollution, and we heard examples of that both in India and I think you mentioned China as well, and Germany, of course, and everywhere else where coal-fired power plants are a central part of the energy mix. And we also know the health effect. I think another number that's been recently said is 800,000 premature deaths comes directly from coal-fired power plants and the pollution that that causes. And I think the interesting part is there are better alternatives today. So, I mean, we need to shift the debate towards the better alternatives, towards renewables. They're better from a long-term point of view. They're better in terms of climate change. They're better in terms of local pollution. And they're also better in terms of water uh, efficiency, in terms of the fact that coal-fired power plants use a lot of fresh water. So, I mean, across the board, this is a win about moving away from coal-fired power plants towards renewables. Uh, Lutz Weischer, we saw that uh, protest by Greenpeace at the summit uh, a, a regatta, if you will, on the River Rhine in Bonn, highlighting Germany's continued dependency uh, on coal. Uh, it's a country that's weaning itself off of nuclear power. Can it realistically do both? Yes, it absolutely can. It's really an absurd situation. Uh, Germany has been very successful at growing renewable energies. Um, the German energy transition is a success story up to a certain point. And if you look at how um, affordable and reliable renewable energies like wind and solar power have become and how quickly they've grown and what a large share of the German energy mix they make up. The problem is the transition is incomplete. We haven't really addressed uh, the fossil fuels in the system and began to face down the coal fired power plants. Germany right now has a huge overcapacity in terms of power supply and is actually exporting to our European uh, neighbors uh, lots of coal-fired electricity. So we don't really need it. Uh, Germany does not need to be running all of these coal-fired power plants, but because the powerful economic interests of the energy producing companies, I mean, they can still make money with these coal-fired power plants. Um, because and and will, too will the German Chancellor change um, her so too? Running them and export the power. Will the German Chancellor change that policy once she's formed her coalition government? Well, we expect her to do that. She's promised in the campaign that she would um, uh, do everything she can to reach Germany's uh, 2020 climate target, which is to reduce emissions by 40% over 1990 levels. And we're really far away from that. Current projections would have Germany miss that by around 10 percentage points, which would, of course, mean a huge loss of credibility on the international scale and be really embarrassing and not up to the challenge. So the future government has to address this. And closing down coal-fired power plants will have to be part of the solution. There's simply no other way of reaching that target. By what date, again? Um, we uh, estimate that you would have to close down uh, half of the power plants, the oldest and dirtiest, uh, by 2020 to reach the 2020 target, and then over the next decade address the other half. 
Uh, Arun- and as we've seen today with the announcement of the yeah, let me let me bring in Sri Arun- Arun- um, Kumar Mehta on this. We have a this. number of developed countries that are doing the same. A number of de- developing uh, developed countries that are doing the same with, as we saw with those twenty nations. Uh, Sri Arun Kumar Mehta. The amount of coal-fired energy that's produced in India much, much bigger than uh, than that in Germany. Uh, when do you expect India to end its coal dependency? I think this issue needs to be understood in the perspective. Uh, we have 300 million people who don't have access to electricity as of now. And our Honorable Prime Minister has announced that we would like to provide uh, like to provide electricity to every every household by 2019 so we have to serve these 300 million people who are without access to electricity let me give you another figure uh, we have 500 million people who use uh, wood biomass for meeting their cooking needs so we have a huge population that needs to be served our per capita energy consumption is just about one third of the global average our Per capita, in a, uh, but can you increase CO2 the grid without coal? Is my question. World average. There are two things we are doing. We are increasing the share of renewables. We have a program for 175 gigawatts of renewable by 2022. And on the second hand, we are improving efficiency, and we have decided uh, that all major thermal power plants in future will be ultra uh, supercritical. So we are b- following both the tracks to Im- bring about improvement. Per Espen Stockness. And we are very, very but, certain that we will be able to meet our... That you'll be able yeah. to, to meet your targets. Uh, per yeah. Espen Stockness, mm. let, let, let me bring, in, bring you in on this. You just heard there the minister say, you know, we want to go green, but we also uh, need to provide electricity for all those parts of India that don't yet have it. What do you think? I think this um, story of uh, how we will solve global warming is becoming clearer and clearer um, and goes uh, against maybe the expectations of uh, many people today who hear all these alarming news. Um, the, there are some very impressive trends just under the radar uh, and uh, has been a little bit mentioned, but like solar and wind energy. Solar, for instance, over the 10 years, 10 last years have doubled five times and with only four more doublings uh, going forward into the 2030 we will install maybe like 900 gigawatts per year annual new capacity and that will be more than enough for all people alive uh, after some years to have their fair share of clean renewable power um, so this doubling, the exponential growth of sun and wind is really hard for the human brain to understand how incredibly fast these things are growing. Then when you combine this with the rapid decline in battery costs and the in- amazing growth of electric vehicles the last years, if these exponential trends go on, um, more or less all transportation will be fully electric by the 2040s. Because not because um, uh, of political um, pressure only, but mainly because people will see it's so much cheaper. You get further. The comfort it's more comfortable, and the acceleration is better. So, electric transport will just completely replace fossil engines, just like digital photography have replaced uh, analog films from the 1998. I'm sure Kodak back then said, well, you know, there will be a certain share for analog film and a certain share for digital film, but we don't have any analog films any longer. Now, it's, 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 a big track- day. it's been a big day, Per Espen Stockness, for, uh, for Norway in the sense that we've heard from your sovereign wealth fund, uh, $1 trillion fund. Uh, wants to divest its oil and gas holdings. Uh, Lutz Weischer there earlier saying that uh, Germany continues to export coal simply to make money and not really uh, because of some great imperative. Uh, Should the next Mm. step be for Norway to stop drilling oil? As a politician, um, I work for uh, Norway to stop... uh, exploration and drilling for further oil. Um, So at some point, um, Norway will stop 
making new oil fields and then because oil fields rapidly deplete over a 10 to 15 year period typically uh, we will see oil production declining i believe the economics now of developing new fields up for, far north in the barents region for norway is really really risky and the profitability is sliding uh, and more and more financial analysts are seeing this uh, more and more Petroleum companies are recognizing this, even if still politicians and some oil companies still want to do. So we have the same situation in Norway as in Germany. There's an intense debate going on uh, as to the long term um, horizon for these conventional energy forms. Philip uh, Rippen, do you I agree? Yeah, I wouldn't disagree with a lot of what is said. I think, you know, we welcome the recommendation by, by Norges Bank. We've been saying that for many years. And isolatedly from the environmental aspect, just from a financial point of view, um, the fact of reinvesting the money that uh, is generated from oil back into oil companies um, just doubles up your, your risk, if not more than that, given the exposure to, to, uh, to uh, oil that Norway has in the economy in general. So, I mean, we absolutely welcome the decision uh, or the uh, recommendation by Norges Bank, and we've been saying that for 10 years. When it comes to the other side of, of things from an environmental point of view, what does become clear is um, the Norges Bank has been a clear and active owner when it comes to climate change issues. So once they pull out, and if they do pull out of, of the oil and gas sector, it will be up to the rest of the financial industry to continue that voice and, and push these companies to transition transition into uh, a low-carbon economy. Transition into a low-carbon economy. Uh, Sri Arun Kumar Mehta, of course, there's uh, short-term uh, profits that can be made by doing things like uh, uh, drilling for oil, uh, extracting coal, uh, and then there's the, the longer term. Uh, is India thinking long-term right now? We are thinking long term, and that's why we we have this uh, target of uh, having installed capacity of 40% in the renewable sector by 2030. So that's a major improvement, and we are going to take this much further by 2040. So and, and there is a clear there, when emphasis you heard there on renewables. From, uh, when you heard we from, have a very very when you heard there from uh, uh, Per Espen Stockness about the potential of solar. Do you agree that in India you're you're ready to? Uh, well, uh, that solar could perhaps even solve your problems. We have our projections. Let me first say that we are very confident of meeting our target, which we have committed under the, uh, what we call nationally determined contributions. So there we have committed 33 to 35% by 2030, with reference to 2005. That we are going to certainly achieve. We are probably going to do much better. But having said that, our projections are that coal will continue to be mainstay for energy mix. And uh, that's why I'm saying that since different countries are placed differently in terms of how they would ensure that they have energy security, that the need for their development. And let me also say that electricity per capita electricity consumption is linked to human development index. So we have a problem. Uh, our per capita electricity consumption is just about one third. We definitely need to improve that. And uh, while we will be placing as much emphasis on renewables as is possible, and technology will play a major role. In fact, the, uh, the tariff, solar tariff, has come down very drastically in India now. So that creates a potential, which probably three years back we wouldn't have felt that way. But now it is much better. Things are improving and technology is going to be a major driver. All right, so there could be good news uh, thanks to technology when it comes to that switch to renewables. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. Arun Kumar Mehta, many thanks for joining us from Bonn. I want to thank uh, Per Espen Stockness in Oslo, uh, Philip Rippmann in Akershus, uh, Norway, and uh, Lutz Weischer also in uh, the German city of Bonn at the COP23 summit. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. We say hello to Emma James. It was fascinating to hear climate psychologist uh, Per Espen Stockness say, stop using the polar bear as a symbol because it makes it seem too remote, like it's not something that's a problem for people uh, 
living here in countries true. that we aren't. We tend to see too many polar bears wandering around the streets of Paris. And uh, it, it is true that really the polar bear appears to have become something of the symbol of this whole COP23. Um, many of the images that I've seen online involve polar bears, including those by cartoonists. Mm. Um, this one, a very much a French take on the situation. French cartoonist Man entitling this State of Emergency, because, of course, at the beginning of the week, if you remember, we had a very apocalyptic view of the future coming from more than 15,000 scientists saying it's almost too late to save the yeah, world. Yeah, was the front page headline in Le Monde there. Absolutely, and this is his uh, take on it with the polar bear and the penguin uh, on a small block of ice floating in the ocean, surrounded by soldiers. Uh, French course, soldiers, I might say. Yes, very much uh, the scene that we have seen here in France over the last couple of years. Um, another cartoonist on this one, Moussio, uh, has another polar bear saying uh, the polar bears are obliged to adapt to climate change and he says, call me Solar Bear. And he's carrying an ice box and suntan lotion uh, and looking really rather depressed and sorry for himself. Also on the streets of Bonn, um, for this particular climate change meeting, lots Ooh. of different artworks have popped up. Now, this one seems to be the one that's gained the most attention. It's called Unbearable, which is a very fitting name, really, because it is quite grim to look at. Um, it's a polar bear basically speared by an oil pipeline. Um, but that oil pipeline also symbolises the temperatures that just keep on rising, and it's been speared on that. It was created uh, by the Danish artist Jens Jalsiot uh, in in collusion with uh, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And that one has a lot of people talking. The main story coming out today, though, from Bonn has, of course, been that multinational coalition uh, of countries who are pledging to end the use of coal for energy production by 2030. Uh, 20 countries so far. They aim to have 50 by the time the next UN Climate Summit comes around in 2018. Um, the reason for the urgency on this, 800,000 deaths a year are blamed on the air pollution caused by uh, coal alone, the dirtiest fossil fuel that we have. Now, France, UK and Canada are among those who've signed up to this. Interestingly, though, Germany hasn't, uh, a point that has been uh, seized on by the cartoonist Chonou, who has uh, Angela Merkel there covered in coal dust, and she says, uh, I won't kiss you hello. Emmanuel Macron, of course, is the man approaching her, looking slightly startled by her appearance. Um, and, and, and you see that in the background there it says coalition, because she's in the middle of... Uh, negotiating a coalition there and indeed there are many many uh plays on words that you can do she's with got to bring the coal. greens on the one yes. side the liberals on the other and they don't agree indeed <laughs> um now this quote uh came from a french minister who was at the coal alliance meeting uh not attributed to anyone in particular uh but it says when we moved from stone age to iron age it was not because we had no, no more stones but because it was better and, of course, it's not just Germany, the dissenting voice. The loudest one by far is, of course, the United States. Um, and that's worth pointing out that the only U.S. Um, event at this uh, climate summit in Bonn uh, was arranged very much on the sidelines, and it was one promoting coal. Uh, that is a quote from New York, former New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg that you're laughing like at there. Promoting tobacco at a yes. cancer summit. <laughs> promoting coal at a climate summit is like promoting tobacco at a cancer summit. I think lots of people in agreement there. The other thing worth noting, though, is that there are plenty of US states, 20 in all, uh, and 110 cities that have pledged to keep to those restrictions of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and so it will be interesting to see how these things play out, whether the US will eventually fall into line or whether Donald Trump will stand alone against uh, action on climate change. Yeah, we had panelists saying, in fact, that uh, Donald Trump's galvanized the environmentalists. So something to watch. Many thanks, Emma James. Uh, we want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.